Good morning. Welcome to Fourth Plain Church of the Nazarene. I'm so happy to see you all here today. I do have some announcements, but first, wow, can we just thank God for how much he loves us? So announcements today. This evening, Camus Church of the Nazarene is hosting some missionaries, um, Carlos and Robin Roddy. So this will be at Camus Church of the Nazarene tonight at 5 p.m. And if you want to hear about missions work around the world, especially in Argentina, then this is the place to be. So come tonight at five o'clock. We'll get to hear the Roddies speak about just how God's working through their lives. And then afterward, there'll be a soup potluck. And I hear there's several churches that have been invited to this. So I just think this is a great opportunity, not only to hear from the missionaries, but also just to connect with all the different churches in our area and spend this time together. Um, hearing how God is at work. And a few other things we have coming up. Our ladies prayer group has started and they meet Tuesdays at 10 a.m. So if you want to join them, you can talk to Carolee or Valerie, or I think the sign-up sheet is still out in the foyer. You can sign up there. Um, but just know that these groups meet Tuesdays at 10 a.m. in the conference room, which is over in the other building. And that's available to any ladies who would like to come. And then this Friday, February 2nd, it's the first Friday of the month, so it's our Country Gospel Week. So if you want to come praise the Lord through country music and just getting together through song, then that will be this Friday at 6.30 p.m. for the Country Gospel Sing. Then next week is our first Wednesday movie night. And you've probably seen it in the announcements, but it's going to be a little different this time. February 7th at 6 p.m., we'll be watching the movie The Blind, and the teenagers will be serving everyone dinner. So you can take the night off from cooking, and the teens will make you a spaghetti feed. And we're doing this as a fundraiser for our winter retreat. So we just ask that um, you please come ready with a donation, and we'll be happy to serve you dinner, and you can eat it while watching the movie, and just invite all your friends to come out for that night. And then my last announcement is that our annual meeting is coming up. So the Church of the Nazarene, our calendar year runs from March through February. So February 25th, we're gonna have our annual meeting where each of our ministry leaders just presents a little thing to you about what's going on in the church to keep everyone up to date. So make sure to mark your calendars for February 25th to come hear what God's doing through this church. So that's all my announcements today, and now I'll go ahead and pray with everyone, if you'll bow your heads with me. Lord, I just thank you for your amazing, unending love for us. I just ask that you fill this place with your presence and touch each and every heart here today. Please be with Pastor Grady as he speaks, and just speak through his sermon. I thank you for the ways that you're at work through Pastor Grady, through Pastor John, through everyone in this church, through missionaries and everywhere around the world. Lord, I just ask that you be with us and show us each how to do your will and show your love to other people. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning. Good morning. I am Pastor John. I am the children's pastor here at Fourth Plain. Pastor, it is good to see you. <laughs> Thank you for, um, we're glad that you're up, and I don't want to say better, but like, <laughs> but no, can we thank Pastor Grady for being here and everything he does, and our fearless leader. Who is mortal? Yes. Um, I don't have an object today for my children's lesson, but it's more of a principle that I think we would do better to um, implement for our children. Um, when I started teen ministry here, um, 
I did what I called holy reading. And what that is, is it's praying with scripture. And it's just taking a section of scripture and you get quiet. The whole thing is to just be quiet through the whole time and listen to what God has to say. And you read the passage about five or six times and you read it slowly. And each time, uh, sometimes different words pop out at you. And when that happens, you, you're not like, you're not Bible studying this passage. You're not looking at all these different things like historical context, anything like that. You're just letting the Holy Spirit speak to you through what you have right before you. And whenever a little word jumps out at you, sometimes it's a word, sometimes it's an image, you begin to chew on that. And it's, it brings it down, brings the word down a lot deeper than we normally do that. And so I did that this morning um, in our children's church. And it was just with First John uh, chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Um, I'll just read it once, otherwise it would take up the whole time. But it says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And during that time, um, uh, first I'll say, uh, silence is necessary to get quiet with the Lord. Jesus said, go into your closet and pray. Um, you don't have to do that all the time. You don't have to be like, I'm going to my closet. Like, be quiet. Quiet your heart before the Lord. Pray in silence. And that's really valuable. Um, the first time I did this, one of our teens had a really big headache during the day, just school, and then didn't want to come to youth group, but came anyway. And just after reading scripture in silence, about 15 minutes, the headache was gone. And we ended the night in worship, and I could see them actually pouring forth just genuine peaceful tears. Not that they needed to repent of everything, anything, but they needed to just be with the Lord. And the word that um, sort of jumped out to me during that time was sent. And, you know, you hear it all the time, but it just kind of hit me again that God sent Jesus. It's for a purpose. And the purpose was so that we might live through him. And I began to just connect the dots, well, the Holy Spirit did in me, that love makes people live. God's love makes us live. And it kind of helped me understand that when um, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God, and that's why we keep his commandments. That's why we come to church. That's why we pray. That's why we read scripture. That's why we seek to do his will so that we may live, and we live because of it. Love really is our life. It's the life of the Christian. It's not about being correct, although that is part of it. Um, it's not about having great gifts. It's not about just feeling good. It's love. And then we talked about love a little more, and it set the tone for a, a good talk because well, sometimes we like to get, you know, a little, little intellectual about what it means that God is love, and you're like, oh, yeah, well, the Greek says, you know, it's this kind of love. Like, well, I just asked Ruby this morning, like, what, what is love to you? 
and we talked about um, like friendship and family and uh, like when and romantic love and you know at first my my instinct is to be like well you know it, it's not really like that kind of love but no no what's our t what's our what's one of our nicknames as the church is the bride of Christ and Christ is the bridegroom and what that means is I'm thinking about the time when Ashley and I got married is it was at this church and I thought about how when when two people man and a woman want to get married that's a picture of what God's love is for us you know the agape is like it's inclusive of that kind of stuff that that's a picture that's what God's love looks like because they want to spend the rest of their lives together they want to do life together they want to grow they want to be one that's what God's love is for us too um, and on top of that like friendship despite the fact that life happens friends are always friends and despite the fact that with family, the ups and downs, they still love and defend each other. That's what God's love is like too. So this morning, think of God's love as not, not separate from everything, but that we see God in love and we know God through love. And that if we love, we abide in God and we know God. So keep his commandments in that way. Be born of God today. Don't just remember that you have been born of God, but be born of God and know God today. And if you get the chance, read scripture in silence. Read it about four or five times, just a little section. Let God speak to you. He's the teacher and he's also the author. So that's, uh, he's the best one to go to. So thank you. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It is good to be with you. I uh, missed you last week, and uh, I'm glad to be back. I appreciate all your prayers, your uh, notes, and uh, you guys are good lovers. Thank you. Pastor John filled in at the last minute, did a great job, according to Carol Lee, and uh, we're glad. The ushers come at this time. And we missed a uh, Sunday because of the snow and ice. So this has been uh, kind of an interesting uh, January, to say the least. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for uh, your goodness, for bringing us back together. I pray that you'll be uh, watchful over our service and be glad. Yeah. In all that is said and done, in thy precious name, amen.
Thank you, Jim. What a friend we have in Jesus. That was the name of that song. That was very nice. Thank you. Let's all stand as we uh, join together and let's prepare our hearts, if you haven't already, as we sing and worship our Lord and through song. Praise Him, praise Him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail him, hail him, Jesus the crucified. Sound his praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown him, crown him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. And I will bless thee, O Lord. Thee, o Lord. I will bless thee, O Lord. I will bless thee, O Lord. With a heart of thanksgiving, I will bless thee, O Lord. With our hands lifted up. With my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise, with a heart of thanksgiving, I will bless Thee, O Lord. Let's sing that first part. I will bless Thee, O Lord. I will bless Thee, O Lord. Thee, O Lord, with a heart of thanksgiving, I will bless Thee, O Lord. One more time, with our hands lifted up, with my hands lifted up, and my mouth filled with praise. Amen. You may be 
seated and search me Last week, I would have, uh, I only had uh, three or four steps, and then I would uh, dive for a, a chair. Uh, something in my back went out, just getting out of bed. So I've stopped getting out of bed. Don't do that anymore. I just stay, stay there. That's it. We are uh, at the last uh, part of our five love languages. And today's is on touchy-feely. 
Luke 15, we heard about the prodigal son. Isn't that a great opening? Uh, I, uh, I thought, I'm going to go ahead and, and do it again. That is just a, a beautiful rendition of what the prodigal son and that whole story of love. In Luke 15, verse 20, so he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. So we finally made it to our, our fifth love language, and now it is on touch. And this, is, uh, this encompasses how we should love our neighbors as well as God with all our heart, soul, and strength. And to love our neighbors properly, we need to get to know them. And what, what really talks to them and speaks to them in the area of love. So this morning, we focused our love language on touch. Touch communicates things to different people. I, with my wife, we would um, see a, a pickup go by, and you know those bench pickup uh, seats where you could sit anywhere along there? And I would look and I would see the woman sitting right next to the husband when the, she could have been over at the other door. And I would say to her, this woman really loves her husband. Touch means different things to different people. It's a powerful, and I would say it's the most powerful language of love. COVID-19 was a killer of, of that love. Stay away. No touching. Uh, don't breathe on each other, even. According to Jenna Lee, science shows that people are able to communicate a wider range of emotions through touch than through words. So studies have shown that even a waitress, if she gently touches, now you're going to, you might want to take this down in notes. If she gently touches you, you will give her a bigger tip. They have found that to be true. So just watch when, when you have a waitress that touches you, you know, oh, she's after that bigger tip. Other studies show that um, Marlene, you'll like this, NBA players, they need to get, uh, the Blazers need to do a little bit better job on this says that when they do uh, high fives, fist pumps, uh, when hugs and team huddles, they win more games. People in hospitals. Teresa, you know about hospitals. People in hospitals. Touch means so much to them. Just a gentle touch on the shoulder. Uh, I've seen many when it comes to the end of a visit and it's time for prayer, I'll gently put my hand on the shoulder or on the hand and all of a sudden tears begin to flow. Touch is the primary means of communicating compassion. It is what we use to, to let people know that we care. Isn't it interesting that when it comes to funerals, some people can't send flowers they have to fly all the way simply to give them a hug. Touch means that much. Babies stop their crying when the parents pick them up and hold them. And babies are held a lot. It's the primary way of communicating to the young child that they are loved. Of course, a clean diaper and, and a bottle also help. But many adults have given up hugs and holding hands. Touch is often among the young children. They don't mind sitting close together. Have you ever noticed that? When you have a, a bunch of uh, kids at VBS and they'll, they'll squish up with each other and, and they're not a bother at all. Boy, when, when they get to be teens, it's uh, stay away from me. Give me my space. And then there's this time when a child doesn't want their mother kissing them while everybody is watching on the bus. Stop that. 
In 1966, a psychologist went around the world observing two friends at a coffee shop. He watched for the same amount of time and counted how many times they made physical contact. In England, zero. In the United States, friends touch each other twice. In France, 110 times friends touched each other. In Puerto Rico, 180 touches with the same amount of time. Touch can be confusing. When uh, someone comes and, and gives them a hug, they may take it in the wrong way. A hug, a uh, holding of a hand, a squeeze, a touch, communicates love and security. Everything is going uh, to be all right, all because of touch. When somebody is scared, you give them a hug. Many adults suffer because it's been so long since their loved ones have touched them. Let's look at the prodigal son and how the father loved him through touch. Love begins with the father running. And when the prodigal son returns, the very first language the father expresses to the son is touch. The father didn't care about the crowd, uh, what the crowd thought, or what it might soil his, his uh, clothes, his own clothes, because of getting too close. His son was dead and now lives. I'm running. I can't wait to hug my boy. The father ran. This shows the urgency and the lack of restraint that was coming for his loving uh, boy. Many sons today would love to have their father simply hug them. Words of, uh, of affirmation or a gift might be nice, but that hug would fill their love tank. Jesus gives us this illustration as a word picture of what his heavenly father is like. He ran to embrace his lost son. The whole scene oozes with love. Learning about our love languages better explains our Christian walk also. Devotions and worship uh, are better understood when they appreciate the love languages. Devotion and quiet time consists may be challenging to the person who has been dominated by touch. The, they are more susceptible to mood swings. They depend on their mood to know whether they're right or wrong, whether they like the Bible or, or they're not getting anything out of the Bible. Feelings become the barometer of how their walk with the Lord is. If we're having a good day, our health is good, then we believe the relationship with our Lord is, is as good as it can get. But when depression hits, we feel like we have lost our salvation. Music is another factor. It sets the mood and enables them to worship. And they cannot understand how other people talk about, all I want to do is hear the word. I don't want to uh, sing anymore. Uh, in prison, we had a two-hour service. Aren't you glad you're not in prison? Two-hour service. And in that time, the first part of it was music. And the second part was preaching. A load of inmates would come just for the preaching, and then there would be some who would leave because the singing was done. It shows the differences in worship and what that means. The love began with the father running. And we can see how devotions can affect us and our emotions. Those that have touch as their love language, their emotions are stirred. They, get, they don't get anything out of the message, but they get something out of the music. Have you ever heard someone say, 
I feel the Lord's presence in the service today. Have you ever heard somebody say that? This is the kind of statement that a person with touch as their primary language would use. They're also quick to say that the mood seems to be down. We would have inmates uh, begin the service and the majority of them would try to pray the devil out of the service so we could have a good mood in, the, in our service. Interesting enough, I made dust one between my sophomore and junior year. Now, my wife tries to get rid of all the dust, but I was making dust. It was for uh, the crops, and they would dust their, their crops with us. And there was an interesting young man that I, I worked with. He was interesting. He didn't believe in, uh, he called himself an, uh, an atheist, lived with two women, um, had nothing to do with the church. And so we had long conversations. And in the midst of it, he said, you know, when I was in San Francisco, I went to a church of Satan, but I left halfway through because I didn't like the mood, the spirit that was in there. That was interesting. I, you know, I raised in the church, you hear that uh, terminology all the time, but from uh, somebody that doesn't even have uh, the Lord in their life, and yet that bothered them so much that he left in the middle of it. So there's a feeling, a spirit that the, those that have touch can connect with and want to connect with. Well, we return to Jesus and his disciples and in John 13, the washing of the feet. This week, we want to look through the eyes of touch. The, the night Jesus got down on the floor, removed his outer garments, and washed the disciples' feet. It was one of the most intimate times recorded in their three-year journey. But it made some uncomfortable. You see, touch means communicating our feelings, but it is often misunderstood. A simple hug from a woman can be misinterpreted by the man. But there is power behind the touch. The foot washing was a very close and personal moment that each disciple, and it, it meant different things to different ones. I believe that there were two disciples that were really, uh, their love tank was filled because of it. John, the beloved disciple. John probably could not understand Peter saying, never shall you wash my feet. Well, why wouldn't you want Jesus touching your feet? That was such an intimate time. And yet, the difference between John and Peter were stark. And Jesus, John knew that Jesus had to answer Peter. And he rightfully said, then you will have no part with me. Well, Peter went overboard and said, then do a sponge bath, wash me all. Jesus calms Peter down and explains the purpose of washing the feet. John spoke the love language of touch fluently. He welcomed Jesus' touch. Peter and John are good examples of how we feel in different ways. It shows us why some love singing more than the preaching. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on that. I'll let that one go. Let's look closer at the two disciples whose love language was touched. The first one is John. John 13, verse 25. John, leaning back on Jesus' chest, said to him, Lord, who is it? Now remember, it was John who wrote this. Those are his memories of the event. One detail, he wanted everyone to know that Jesus loved him through his touch. How do I know 
that touch was John's love language, turn to John 21. It describes a, a time when the disciples were at the seashore and John 21, verse 20. Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved and following them, the one who also had leaned back on his chest at the supper and said, Lord, who is it? Who is the one who betrays you? Now, now wait a minute. John's writing that. John wanted everyone to know he was the disciple that leaned against Jesus' chest because that is how he knew he was the beloved disciple. He wanted everyone to remember who he was and how he was the one who was loved by Jesus through touch. The second disciple is Thomas. Thomas missed seeing Jesus when he came to the disciples. We don't know why. The Bible does not explain the reason. But here, Thomas is, is confronted with the rest of the disciples. The disciples say, uh, Thomas, you really missed something. Jesus is alive. He is resurrected. He came and we saw him. Think about that for a moment. Thomas had seen a lot of curious things in his walking with Jesus. He saw all kinds of miracles. And yet, for some reason, this one he would not believe. Not until I see. John 20, verse 25. The, Therefore were saying to Thomas, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of the nails, and put my fingers into the place of the nails, and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. Thomas clarified that he must have more than a simple glimpse of Jesus. He must be able to actually reach out and touch him. Eight days would come and go, and Jesus appears and says, Peace be with you. Those words of affirmation were not enough, were enough for most, but Jesus focuses in on Thomas. I am sure Thomas was very embarrassed to follow through, and so Jesus gives him the power to follow through. John 20, verse 27. Then Jesus said to Thomas, reach here with your finger and see my hand, and reach here your hand and put it in my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Thomas's love tank was completely full. He had the opportunity to actually reach in and touch Jesus. But I want you to notice it was something more than a human that he touched. He actually understood he was touching God himself. Jesus uses this moment to bless even our generation. Jesus said to him, because you have seen, have you believed? Blessed are they who did not see and yet believe. We can only speculate what it will be like to see that moment when we can actually touch Jesus for ourselves. Thomas got his moment, but we must wait for ours. Jesus will encourage us to gain what we lack in physical touch by sending the Holy Spirit. And he even says, it is better for you that you have the Holy Spirit to comfort you. Let's look at other scriptures that deal with Jesus in physical touch. Children were invited to touch Jesus. There are many mothers, for some reason, they wanted Jesus to reach out and touch their children. There's no miracle. There's nothing other than, can you touch my child and bless him? Matthew 19, verse 13. Then some children were brought to Jesus 
so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And after laying hands on them, he departed from there. All it was was Jesus touching them. No miracle. Nothing else happened other than a simple touch. Remember the centurion who Jesus uh, was confronted with and, and he had a servant that was sick and he said to, to Jesus, you don't need to go to the house. All you need to do is say the word. And he believed the servant would be healed. In Mark chapter 5, a story is told of a woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years. She tried many doctors, and instead of getting better, she only got worse. The scripture says that she heard about Jesus. She devised a plan to go through the crowd, touch the hem of his garment, and for her, touch was everything. The crowd was large, but she reached through to touch Jesus' him. And you remember the story. Jesus questioned, who touched him? And the disciples did not understand. How could you say that when so many people are crowding around? But Jesus knew someone was healed. The woman panicked. This was not part of her plan. She uh, just wanted a chance to touch Jesus' him and be gone. Jesus wanted her to know that there's far more than just a cure. And Jesus lifts her up as well as the centurion as the means of faith that they had. There's one final witness in Scripture that I'd like to point at. It's found in Matthew 8, 1 through 4. I'm going to use Max Licato to tell the story of the leper and Jesus. Here is Max Licato's expanded version of Matthew 8, 1 through 4. Five years, no one touched me. No one. Not one person. Not my wife, not my child. Now, my friends, no one touched me. They saw me. They spoke to me. I sensed their love and their voices. I saw concern in their eyes, but I did not feel their touch. There was no touch. Not once. No one touched me. Five years have passed, and no one has touched me until today. The priest didn't even touch me. He looked at my hand, and now wrapped in a rag. He looked at my face, now shadowed in sorrow. I've never faulted him for what he said. He was only doing as he was instructed. He covered his mouth, extended his hand, palm forward. You are unclean, he told me. With one pronouncement, I lost my family my farm, my future, and my friends. My wife met me at the city gates and with a sack of clothes, clothes and bread and coins. She didn't speak. By now, friends had gathered. What I saw in their eyes was a precursor to what I've seen in every eye since, fearful pity. As I stepped out, they stepped back. Their horror of my disease was greater than their concern for my heart. And so everyone else that I have seen stepped back. But then I saw him. When I saw him, I was changed. Before he spoke, I knew he cared. Somehow I knew he hated this disease as much, no more than I hate it. My rage became my trust, and my anger became hope. From behind a rock, I watched him descend the hill, 
throngs of people following him. I waited until he was only paces from me, and then I stepped out. Master! He stopped and looked in my direction. And as dozens of others, a flood of fear swept across the crowd. Arms flew in front of faces. Children ducked behind their parents. Unclean! Someone shouted. Again, I don't believe, I don't blame them. I was a huddled mass of death, but I scarcely heard them. I scarcely saw them. Their panic I'd seen a thousand times. His compassion, however, I had never beheld. Everyone stepped back except him. He stepped toward me. Toward me. Lord, you can help me. You can heal me if, if you will. Had he healed me with a word, I would have been thrilled. Had he cured me with a prayer, I would have rejoiced. But he wasn't satisfied with speaking to me. He drew me near. He touched me. Five years ago, my wife had touched me. And no one had touched me since until today. I will. His words were as tender as his touch. He healed. He cupped his hands on my cheeks and drew me so near I could feel the warmth of his breath and see the wetness of his eyes. Don't tell anyone about this. But go and show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses uh, commanded for people who had been made well. This will show the people what I have done. And so that's where I'm going. I will show myself to the priest and embrace him. And I will never forget the one who dared touch me. He could have healed me with a word but he wanted to do more than heal me. He wanted to honor and validate me. Imagine that, unworthy of touch of a man, yet worthy a touch of God. This illustrates how some people will never feel loved without a hug. The word of Jesus banished uh, the leper's infection, the loneliness. However, it was treated by the touch of Jesus. Many of you have felt the touch of Jesus. You understand what is spoken. One day we will see the Father run to us, embrace us, and welcoming us home. We made it. I've tried to explain the five different love languages that operate in our communicating love to one another. And we see how Jesus tried to tell the story of the lost coin and the lost animal and the lost son. So the Pharisees and the tax gatherers and the sinners would understand God's love for them. God truly loves us and wants us to love one another. Will you stand with me? Since I met this blessed Savior, since he cleansed and made me whole, I will never see to praise him I'll shout it I'll eternity rose he touched me oh he touched me and oh the joy that floods my soul. Something happened 
And now I know he touched me and made me whole. Let's pray. Paul prayed this prayer. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to his riches and glory, to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend all of the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, According to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. God bless you, and you are dismissed.